And God, we thank you tonight because we know, God, that you're here amongst us. And Father, I pray tonight for each and every hand, God, that was raised here in this building. God, that you would reach down your hand and just intervene and make a way where there seems to be no way. God, those that need a healing touch in their bodies, God, just speak a word and allow them to be healed tonight. God, those that are not able to be here tonight, God, those that are at home, God, speak to them right where they're at tonight and let the healing power of God just minister to them. And God, as we study your word tonight, open our minds and God in our hearts and let us receive your word with gladness. God, I pray all this tonight in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Let's worship the Lord tonight. seconds <laughs> so he's counting <laughs> I was blessed uh, last Sunday church and that evening watch service it, it was wonderful those of you who could attend I, it was it, I was blessed it, ju- it was eno- just enough to fire you up for 24 God willing and, and to stay in his will stay fired up Let's open up with Alive, Alive. is alive, alive forevermore, alive, alive, alive forevermore, my Jesus is alive, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, my Jesus is alive forevermore, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. Give God some praise tonight. Amen. How many have on their traveling shoes for the Lord in 2024? As strong as I feel like traveling on.
this verse. The Lord has been so good to me. I feel like traveling Oh, yes. Until that blessed home I see, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Amen. Give God another hand clap tonight, church. Amen. You know, I was thinking the other day, with this being a new year, uh, I don't see it down there, but I know it's there someplace. That doesn't mean that prayer box stopped in 2023. We're still praying over those things and those needs in 24, and we're going to continue to pray and believe that God's going to move. Amen. Let's finish up our worship service, church, as we sing, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. be seated. Sister Darla's teaching, but she vamoosed. She's making more cover, I know. Good to have Brother Anthony with us tonight. Would you stand and greet the folks? He's the associate pastor out at Campground Church working under Brother Branham. So good to have you guys tonight with us. Go ahead. Give the Lord a hand clap. Does anybody else have a testimony while she's getting ready? Yes.
Anybody else while she's making her way? Go ahead, Elizabeth. Give God praise. Be in here? Okay. And, uh, well, I, that's what I went and did. I have one extra here in case we run. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oh, goodness. I have another one. Okay. I guess I had enough. After, well, not really. But okay, so I'm excited about this series. We're going to explore 1 Corinthians. I'm not going to focus on any one thing tonight, but just kind of give you an overview because I believe that is important to kind of get the um, the feel of the book and what's going on here. So I gave you those papers, and we're kind of going to just go through those tonight, and I'm going to highlight some particular verses. Uh, but this is just an, over, an introduction to 1 Corinthians. Has anyone here ever read the entirety of 1 Corinthians? I'm sure everybody here. Okay, I'm getting a couple of these, and... Mostly yeses. So it covers a, just a wide variety and range of issues within the church. Paul, the, the church in Corinth, Paul had founded. And then he, you know, he was going on his little mission trips and he was finding, you know, founding other churches. And these churches stayed in constant communication with him through letters. Uh, not text or, you know, phones or anything like that, but through letters that kind of made the rounds through the churches, actually. And so this particular church, they had a lot of problems. Nobody here has ever went to a church that's had problems, have you? Okay. Does it have people in it? There's going to be problems. And so there's a lot of questions in this letter to the church that Paul addresses. And so it has, first of all, it has 16 chapters in it, which just covers a variety of subjects um, that cover a lot of things that happen within a church that we can apply to, our, to the church today. And that's why whenever I started rereading 1 Corinthians here a couple of months back, I'm like, there is just so much richness in this book that we as a body of believers, that we can learn so much from. Because just because we think we, just because we have the entirety of the Bible in front of us does not mean that we still know it all. Now, if you do know it all, I know nobody's here going to admit to it, right? Um, I will gladly change places with you and allow you to teach in my stead. But I've been a Christian for around 30 years now. Uh, that since I truly dedicated my life to Christ, and the more I come to know him, I realize how little I really know about the Bible. You know, because the word is living, and it's sharp like a two-edged sword, and it constantly challenges us. And if it doesn't, then we need to examine ourselves. Even Paul wrote that himself. He said, examine yourselves to see that whether you're in the faith or not, if we act like we're just the perfect little Christian, sometimes we all do that, right? Like, oh, God's been good to me, and I don't have any problems, and I don't know why they always have problems, you know, because it just seems like that family just always has problems, you know, then we need to go look in the mirror, as Paul wrote about. You know, we look in the mirror and we see ourselves, and the minute we turn around and we walk away from it, we forget what manner of man we are. And so the Bible 
is something that we should be looking at that the Holy Spirit reveals where we are in our walk with Christ. And when we read it, we should always do it very prayerfully. Um, so we know that Paul, there was problems in this church, and I'm going to take you to, let's see, page, this is why I numbered these pages. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to normally bounce around, but I want to bounce around for just a second. Um, the background here is Corinth. This is on page two, and then we'll go back to the first page. So the background, Corinth was an ancient city of Greece. It's down at the bottom of the page. Was in many ways the most prominent Greek metropolis of Paul's time. Like many of the prosperous cities today, Corinth was intellectually arrogant, material, materialistic, I wrote that wrong, affluent and morally corrupt. Sin of every kind flourished in this notoriously central city. I believe that we can look around in our world today and we see many cities that are very affluent, sometimes they're very arrogant, they're, and we do live in a very materialistic society. I believe we can all agree upon that. Everybody wants more, 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 but they don't want more of Jesus. Um, and sin is just everywhere. Then it goes on, in conjunction with Priscilla and Aquila, his own apostolic team, Paul founded the Corinthian church during his 18-month ministry at Corinth on his second missionary journey. The church was made up of some Jews, but mostly of ex-pagan Gentiles. <laughs> Lord help us. You realize what we are all ex, unless you have Jewish descent, we are all ex-pagan Gentiles <laughs> sitting here tonight, Okay. After Paul left, a variety of problems arose in the young church requiring his apostolic authority in teaching by written correspondence and personal visits. The first letter to the Corinthians was written during his three-year ministry at Ephesus. On his third missionary journey, reports reached Paul at Ephesus, turn to page three, at Corinth. Afterwards, a delegation from the Corinthian congregation delivered a letter to Paul Request, requesting his instructions on a variety of issues. In response to the reports in the letter from Corinth, Paul wrote this letter. So there's a purpose. If, how many of you have study Bibles? Okay. It's very important to have a good study Bible because you find out all of this information. So if you have a study Bible, you might can go to the very first of that book, and you can read all of this for yourself. But I just want to get you acquainted with this book as we delve into it. Uh, but Paul had two primary reasons in mind as he, penned, as he wrote this epistle. Number one, to reprove and correct the serious problems in the Corinthian church, which had been reported to him. These were disorders which the Corinthians viewed lightly, but which Paul regarded as serious sin. Now, I'm just going to stop right there and make a comment. If there is sin in the church, our pastor, I'm going to pick on the pastor for a second, he needs to point it out. And if he needs to, he's like, darling, don't go there. Okay, but I'm going to go there. Well, sometimes it just means you need to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody when you, know, when you know without a doubt that they have fallen into serious sin. Sometimes it's needed. Is it hard to do? Yes. But sometimes it's needed within the church because we know that the Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of sin in the church affects the entire body because we are to be one body in Christ. So if, if, if this part is doing something wrong, it's going to affect the way this part operates. All right? If your foot's sinning, your left foot's not, it's going to affect the way you walk. All right? Um, so there's things that sometimes uh, as a pastor or a leader, you might have to correct some things. Number two, to provide counsel and instruction on a variety of questions about which the Corinthians had written. They had written letters to him asking particular questions about particular issues. 
These included both issues of doctrine and personal and corporate conduct and purity. Now, if you know anything about the Israelites in the Old Testament, one reason God always told the Israelites to, to kill all of their pagan enemies was because if they didn't, they let them live, they would always end up adopting pagan practices. See, God knew what he was doing. Now, I'm not telling you to go kill people. God forbid. God forbid. Because they're already walking around dead anyway, unfortunately, spiritually. We don't need to slaughter them. We don't need to draw blood. But at the same time, we need to be very careful. Anyway, God told the Israelites to kill the pagans because they always incorporated the paganistic stuff that happened. And they made it to where it seemed very acceptable. Hmm. If we as a church, if we're not careful, and we can see that around the world today, even in the different churches, different practices. I'm not going to call, stand here and call anybody out, but there are some churches that have adopted pagan practices. They allow a lot of things to go on that should not go on. Not very Christ-like qualities go on in some churches. So this is what he's talking about. Then underneath the survey, he says, this epistle addresses the kind of problems that churches experience when members remain carnal. Anybody here tell me what a carnal Christian is? Casual, weak. Somebody else said, what'd you say? Worldly. You said worldly. In the flesh. It's all those things. Uh, well, well, they say that, well, all right, well, here's the thing. Paul talked about the war, war of the flesh and the spirit. So, and I heard, a, I was sharing this with Alan um, years ago, and I think I've shared this before here when I've taught a man that was teaching in, in one of the churches that I went to before, he was talking about the war between the flesh and the spirit. And he goes, now when you, you get saved, that carnal man, that fleshly man, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it, however you want to term it, you are crucified in Christ. You bury that old man, right? And he's supposed to stay dead. Oh, but sometimes, you know, when you bury him, he likes to try to get back up out of that grave. And this teacher made the comment. He goes, well, when that happens, you got to put your foot on his head and shove him back down in that grave and cover him back up and don't let him come back alive, right? So, so yes, I think, I think that just because people can get carnal or fleshly or get in their emotions or whatever it may be, I don't know if that necessarily means that they're not a Christian but here's the thing, if you continue to walk in that carnality, in that fleshly behavior, uh, if you play around with that sin or whatever it is, it's, because we all have a thorn in our flesh, right? We all have something that we struggle with. But if you entertain that enough, it will end up being central in your life rather than Jesus Christ being central in your life. So answer your question, yes. But if you keep on playing around with it, eventually you're going to grow cold and you will fall away. So you have to constantly fight against that. Sometimes it's not, it doesn't seem like such a fight, right? Sometimes we, go, we'll, we can go for months, days, weeks, name your own, <laughs> your own timeline on that. Sometimes we can go and it doesn't feel like anything's coming against us. And I've heard it said, well, if the devil's not coming against you, then you, he's got you. And I kind of disagree with that because I believe that God blesses us. And then there's times that we're, we go through tribulations, we go through trials, we go through troubles. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we're in sin. It just means that maybe God's trying our faith to see. He, he says to the old devil, like he told Job, like, he, like God told the devil concerning Job, consider my servant, you know. 
And really, if you think about it, do those things not build your faith? Now, I know some people tend to pull away from God, and others tend to go closer to God. So you have to answer that for yourself. How is your faith? I can't answer that for you. I know that when uh, David passed away, I just, you know, some people was like, well, why did you take away my loved one? And, you know, and just, they just grieved for years that I would, and I got bounce a lot of things off of Alan. And I thank God for him. God really brought him to me. I truly believe that. And but that caused me to grow closer to God. That may seem really weird. But his death caused me to grow closer. I, I, I pushed in to God. Because I didn't know what else to, I honestly just didn't know what else to do. You know, he's my strength. And I think when we go through difficulties, if you have faith, as we should, and sometimes, yeah, we falter. We, we know we, we get weak sometimes, but for the most part, if we'll stay in the word and stay in prayer, God's going to draw us close to him. Even we, when we don't have the words to say, and I just went down a rabbit trail, and let's come back to 1 Corinthians. But I think it encourage you know, I, think, I feel like it's good when you feel, share your testimony with people. Uh, it encourages people because sometimes people don't know what to do. All right, so we will always ha- we will always need to try to separate ourselves from pagan from the paganistic society, and we do live in a society that just says anything's okay, uh, and even some churches say that as well. But some of the problems that Paul was addressing here in this book is divisiveness. Yes, we still have it in the church, unfortunately. And I think Jennifer kind of touched on it a little bit on Sunday night. You know, there's the worship wars. Oh, well, you know, we're not worshiping this way or that way. Oh, well, we should do this more or we should do this less. Or or I don't like having church five times a week. You know, I think once is enough. I mean, there's just so many different things that the body of Christ actually it actually divides them because we all have an opinion right if you don't have an opinion raise your hand (laughs) nobody raised their hand okay all right so another problem that he addressed was tolerance of sin like incest sexual immorality in general secular lawsuits between christians humanistic humanistic thinking and thinking about ap- ap- humanistic thinking about apostolic truth and conflict over Christian liberty. One person says you can do this, another one says you can't. All right, you're going to have to figure that out between you and God. Yes, in my opinion, there are some things that are black and white. You don't do and you should do. But there are other things that might be in a gray area. And that's where you have to work it out between you and God. And go find some counsel if you need counsel on what's right and wrong. I mean, people can show you where things are in the Bible. Uh, Paul also instructs the Corinthians about matters related to celibacy and marriage. And I've already had somebody inquire if I'm going to be talking about marriage during this uh, time of study in this month of July. And I said, I think I said maybe. Maybe, huh, January, what did I say? <laughs> I am ready for summer, thank you. I do that a lot. Replay. <laughs> I was just checking to see if you were, I was just checking to see if you were listening. Okay. Uh, <laughs> January, I know, right. Lord, forgive me. All right, number four. Problems such as public worship, including the Lord's Supper and the offering for the Jerusalem saints. So anyway, as we look on down through here, we know that Paul wrote about the manifestations and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In the context of corporate worship, more than anywhere else in the New Testament, these chapters provide insight into the character and components of worship in the early church. Paul indicates that God's purpose for the church includes a wide variety of the Spirit's manifestations occurring through faithful believers and individuals called to certain ministries. 
a diversity within, unity makes it very clear in comparison to the functions of a human body. In providing guidelines for the corporate function of spiritual gifts, Paul makes an essential distinction between individual and corporate edification, insisting that all public manifestation or gifts must flow from love. And I'm going to stop there and just make one statement, if I can. If you operate in the gift and want the glory, that's your glory. You're not going to receive any other reward for it. It's what the Bible says. And you're doing it with the, in the wrong, you're operating in the wrong way. It has to flow from love and exist for the edification of the gathered believers. Tongues and interpretation. It's for the edification of the body of Christ. Yes, there are times that it is maybe only for one or two individuals in that congregation. When you say, oh, well, that didn't speak to me. Well, it may not have been expressly for you. But it was for somebody in that body that needed to be edified at that moment. Because that's at, there's been times I've heard it, and it's like, okay, that wasn't for me, but it was for somebody. I mean, anybody else here under, understand what I'm talking about? Okay, so we have special features in this book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, five major features emphasize and characterize 1 Corinthians. First of all, it is the most, number one, this is still on page three, it is the most problem center is pistol in the New Testament. It addresses the various problems and issues at Corinth. And Paul Gibbs, I don't know who he is. <laughs> Ignore my tie, fellow. You can just scratch that out. <laughs> I did proofread it, too, and I didn't see that. Um, Lord have mercy. Okay, let me get control of my. <laughs> I'm just thinking of the BGs. Okay, all right. Good Lord. There is an emphasis, number two, there is an emphasis on the oneness of the local church as the body of Christ focuses. Focus which occurs in discussions about divisions, the Lord's Supper, and spiritual gifts. So we can see that here that there's more. I'm going to just go back to page one. That just knocked me for a loop there. Okay. Goodness gracious. That's bad. All right. So we're going to go to divisions in the church. Now, we're not going to read all of these scriptures tonight. I'm just going to focus on uh, the principal part of each of these sections. And then as we delve on into the book, then I'm, we're going to break it down a little bit more and just focus on some different things. Um, but the divisions in the, ch in the church, we see here there's causes of division and there's a wrong conception of wisdom. There's a wrong conception of Christian ministry. What do you think Christian ministry really means? Does anybody want to... Help me expound on that. Have to have a servant's heart. Absolutely. Anybody else? So it's not an inclu inclusive club here. No, we are to minister to people outside of the church. We come here to be equipped to minister out there. Amen? That is, and then we also see here an appeal for reconciliation. See, God doesn't want his church to be divided. And I'm going to use Alan and I as an example on this. Do you mind? 
He's like, <laughs> too late now, right? Okay. <laughs> well, not at this point since I brought it up, right? Okay. He doesn't mind. He's a good guy. We've talked about we've talked about it at length. He's Lutheran. He was born and raised Lutheran. I was born and raised Pentecostal. And quite frankly, when we met, I'm like, okay, he acts Christ-like. <laughs> but how Christ-like can a Lutheran be? <laughs> right? <laughs> but he might have thought the same thing about me. Especially when he came to the first pep rally at this church. <laughs> I asked him, I said, uh, what did you think of the service? He goes, well, it seemed kind of like a pep rally. And, of course, if anybody knows me, I'm like, yes, it was a pep rally for Jesus. And that's exactly what I did. I clapped my hands. But I'm bringing that up because Darla had, I don't think he had to work it out in his head. Or did you? <laughs> if he did, he's not going to admit it. I had to work it out of my head that a Lutheran can be just as much of a Christian than a Pentecostal. I know, but I know it's not. I know it's not about denomination. But he doesn't worship like I do, <laughs> right? And he's probably saying, well, you don't worship like we do. Terry? Exactly. No, I don't mind. Right. Exactly. They don't act like they do. I do, right? That's right. Well, they don't. They don't clean like I do. <laughs> I mean, that may seem like a silly example, but really, we have those kinds of mindsets. And they do cause division in the church, do they not? Well, they don't preach like Pastor Chris, so I don't want to listen to him preach. Oh, people get caught up in that sort of thing. Well, I don't want anybody but Brother Chris to pray for me. I mean, things like that. It can cause division in the church. When we are all called to be ministers, we are all called to minister to one another. What that looks like is different. Some people are, you know, we have the care care ministry here in the church that I think four or five different people send out cards every week to people who are sick, people who are missing, whatever it may be. I imagine we all probably write, I'm in part of that, I imagine we all kind of write maybe something different inside the cards. So it's different. You know, you've got that, and then you have some that go visit people. Pastor goes and visits people in the hospital. Other people minister in music. I mean, not everybody has the same gift. Exactly. Right, right. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. Right. Right. Absolutely. So, if you don't get anything out of this lesson tonight, get this. Comparison 
divides. Comparison divides. Only, and I will even go even further, compare yourself to what the Word of God says. Don't compare your life to anything else but to what the, but except to the Word. If you compare yourself to somebody else, we're all going to fall short. Or you might think you're better than they are. It's going to be either or. And God forbid. All right. Exactly. And, and, Right. Exactly. Okay. So, you want to say something? Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 I would even go one step further with your thought. If you know somebody's an introvert, you need to reach out to them one on one. Introverts don't do well in crowds. All right. So the principle here is the church is one body of Christ. And I'm going to take you over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I don't want to do this without reading some scripture. Chapter 12, verse 12. And I may just read down a little bit on this rather than just read the one verse. But it says, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many, and I'm going to read on down, If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. We are one body of believers here. We should work together like a very well-oiled wheel. We really should. Um, And then back to chapter 1, beginning at verse 10. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And that base that same mind and in the same judgment actually means common mind and common purpose. We should have the same purpose. And what is our purpose? It says, Help right to lead people to christ to seek those people who are lost that need jesus i've got many opinions and one of my opinions is that the church in united states of america has fallen short in reaching the unsaved lord help us it's not an elite group we have People that in this church that has been delivered from drugs, alcohol, sin-filled lives, 
I mean, it's not just the addicts and the alcoholics that have came to Christ, but we all had to come to the foot of the cross, all right, with whatever our past was. And I'll use this as an, another example. We had just, uh, I don't always announce things like this because it's not everybody's business, but uh, we had to make a quick trip down to Oklahoma, Alan and I, because uh, my mother had been falling. And we had to put her in a nursing home. And so I went down to help my brothers because we had to clear out her apartment and everything. And my oldest brother was going through some papers. <laughs> and he handed me something. He goes, you want that? And I looked at it, and I'm like, um, no. I'm like, that was my past. I said, I don't know why she held on to it for I'm 63 if somebody wants to do the math. I was 15 years old. I was a wild, stupid teenager. My mother kept the paperwork. <laughs> Y'all laugh. I didn't think it was funny. I'm like, I don't want this. I said, I am saved. I have been redeemed. I've been forgiven. I don't need a reminder of that stuff. And I took it. And I ripped it apart, and I threw it in the trash. said, I do not need to leave that for my children to read (laughs) or my grandchildren to read. So you're going to get this principle as well from this lesson. If you're holding on to old things of your child or your grandchild, just go ahead and throw them away. They're not going to want them. (laughs) All right? They're not going to want them. Um. Verse 13, it says, this is in 1 Corinthians 1, 13. It says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? No, Paul was not crucified for you. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, we're not baptized in the name of Paul either. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name we are baptized in the name of jesus christ so we are one but we are linked together we are one body so i have about 10 minutes so there was moral problems in the church and i've already talked about a couple of them i'm not going to go into detail tonight but the principle on this one is you who are united with the lord should conduct yourself so as to bring honor to him. Everything that we do should glorify Christ. That's the way we conduct ourselves outside of church, in business, when we are out purchasing things, you know, work. Every place you go, whatever you say and do should glorify God. The way we act, how you treat people. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like, well, it is. I know, right? I've heard that. I've heard that too. So let's take that to heart when we go out to eat. Yeah. Let's think about even if you're getting bad service. <laughs> I've got store. <laughs> I've got stories after stories of when we went down to Oklahoma. We had went out to Cracker Barrel. Ter- the work, you, you, you Cracker Barrel usually pretty right across the board. You get good service. You get the good food and everything. Am I not right? Anybody go to Cracker Barrel? You, it's, it's usually just straight. It's straight even good service, good food. It was terrible service. My food was fine, but several people's food at the table was cold. They didn't want to leave them a tip. Well, that's, well, that's Alan laid up the tip. He goes, no, she did wait on us. She deserves a tip. And I'm like, you're right. I said, because we don't know what kind of day she had. We don't know what's going on in her life. 
She could, could have just been having a bad day. And so, yeah, how do you want to be treated? We should do unto others as we would have them do unto us. But he left a tip, and then I took the little piece of what they put your culture in, and I left her a little note, and I said, God bless you, and have a Merry Christmas. Because that, yeah, he was right. We can learn things from Lutherans. <laughs> Donna. That's so sad. What a reflection that is on the body of Christ. So if we, let's apply this to us, this body, I mean, I can't go out and teach this everywhere, right? This body, let's make purpose in our heart that we're going to treat people right, correctly out there in public. Let's be kind. We don't know what people are, we really don't know what people are going through that make them act the way they act. So just be kind. Be humble. Don't say, but wait on me before you wait on anybody else. Did James, did you want to say something? Oh, okay. I okay, Beth. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, you, you might find us picking on the church a little bit during this this epistle. But at the same time, I want to encourage us to do right. Uh, let us not be the cause of divisiveness. Let us not be the cause of somebody else stumbling, right? Um, so this uh, comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17. Let's just go through 20. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we need to conduct ourselves to bring honor to God. And then Paul also answers several different questions about which the Corinthians have written. Uh, this is in chapter 7. And the principle on that one is God gives some the gift of a husband or a wife. Others he gives the gift of remaining single for the sake of the kingdom. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say that Paul was married. I think we've got one, well we've got a few people here that are single and somebody that's about to get married I think. Right? She hasn't broken up with you yet, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. I got to pick on them. They're fun to pick on. Sharon just laughs at me. I love her. Okay. So we will probably touch on the marriage part here just because it was requested to me that I touch on it. Uh, then he... Uh, some of the questions also that Paul answered here is concerning the problem of food offered to idols. Paul's discipline, use of liberty. I'm going to page two. A warning against presumptuous overconfidence. The incompatibility of pagan feasts and the Lord's table. And then just some general principles and practical advice.
So if you go over to 1 Corinthians 10, I've got three minutes, so we will, we will finish here today, tonight. <clears throat> 10, 31, and 32. It says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. It says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men and all things, not seeking my own profit, mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So, and then uh, back up to chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a, run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So we need to govern ourselves in a spiritual sense, and act like we are children of God. We need to conduct ourselves in a godly fashion. That doesn't mean we can't have fun. We can have fun. We can have a lot of fun. But it's just a godly way of having fun. If anybody's ever been around me any amount of time, I love to laugh. I laugh at myself. <laughs> I'm one of those people. I entertain myself. What can I say? I think of something and I start laughing, okay? But uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I would just admonish you tonight and encourage you as we go out through this next week. Let's glorify God in everything, the way we treat one another. And I wouldn't pick on you if I didn't like it, all right? I just have to say that for the record. Uh, so if you'll stand, we will close in prayer. Thank you all for coming. You can either keep your papers. If you're afraid you might not bring them back, please hand them to me, and we'll have them next week because that was a lot of copying. <laughs> um, and I, we do appreciate you coming. I think it's going to be a good study, not because I'm teaching it, but because it's God's word. Um, and... Uh, Love you guys, and thank you for being here, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word, dear Lord, and we, we thank you for just helping us, dear Lord, to not be divisive, but that we understand that we are in one spirit, one mind, that we are in unity with one another, dear Lord. And I just pray, Father God, that you would just help us to walk the way you have ordered us to walk, dear Lord, and that is to glorify you every day, every minute and everywhere, and I just pray that you would just give us the strength to follow your word, dear Lord, each and every day, and we just ask you this, and I just pray that you would bless these people, dear Lord, and just go with them, keep them safe, and just make yourself known unto them each and every day. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you got to keep it? Okay, okay, that's fine. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that would be good, wouldn't it? Very, um, yak, 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 yak. <laughs>